parents plus educators plus perseverance equals success. That's a title uh, that uh, the folks here at TEDx gave uh, my presentation. And I couldn't have come up with a better title because it's a story. A story that involves a young man in eighth grade in 1979 uh, that was me. Back in 1979 when I was in eighth grade at Robert Burns Elementary at 25th and Central Park. It is now named Rosario Castellanos, in case you look it up. Uh, my eighth grade math class was in a hallway. Fast forward to 1993, when I became the alderman of the 22nd Ward, and I went to go visit Robert Burns Elementary, that eighth grade math class was still in a hallway. All of the grammar schools in the Little Village neighborhood, in the neighborhood that I represent, were at least 125 and at worst 150 percent capacity. Let me give you an example. Gary Elementary, designed for 800 students, had 1,300 bodies in it. Okay, Robert Burns, the school that I graduated from, designed for 650, had 1,100 students. So one of the first things I did one of the first things we did, and I say we because it's not just about what the aldermen did, because it was a whole team of teachers, community activists, community leaders, and educators, who basically we made it our mission to fight the power, to fight City Hall, to fight the Board of Ed, to relieve the, these overcrowding problems. And between the years of 1993 and 1997, we were able to build five new grammar schools all within two miles of each other. Think of it, five. <laughs> Starting with Finkel on the far east over by Western and 23rd, Madero at 27th and Kedzie, Little Village Academy at 27th and Lawndale, uh, Jose Fortiz de Dominguez at 30th and Lawndale, and then Emiliano Zapata at 27th and Costner. Those five new schools opened up by 1997. And the day they opened up, they were at capacity. And guess what we started thinking up in 1995-96 as these schools were being built? Where are these eighth graders gonna go? <laughs> if we're building all these grammar schools, so we started looking at Farragut Career Academy. Farragut Career Academy is a local neighborhood school who has some attendance boundaries. As you all know, we all, every school has attendance boundaries. And we started doing the research. In the Farragut attendance boundaries lived, this is in 1998, between 42 and 4,300 school-aged kids. And Farragut's capacity is 1,600. At that time, in 1998-1999, Farragut's actual enrollment was close to 3,000. That meant that 1,000 to 1,200 school, high school age youth were going to school somewhere outside their neighborhood. So they had to get on a bus, spend an hour, hour and a half to get there, hour and a half to get back, wasting all that time not being able to go to a neighborhood high school. So during 96-97, uh, we were on the prowl, as you would say for real estate, because for some of you that don't know Little Village, it's a very densely populated neighborhood. And there are very, there's very little land to build on, so we literally used up all the free land when we built the five new grammar schools because we actually had to take half of a park to build a grammar school. So when we were looking to build a high school, we were at a loss. Lo and behold, edible oils went out of business. Not that we celebrated a bankruptcy, but it happened. 16 acres of prime real estate at 31st and Costner became available in October of 1997. What's the first thing I do? I call up the Board of Ed. I say, Mr. Chico, I have the acreage for our school. A little finagling went back and forth. Some advocacy went back and forth. The demographics spoke for themselves. We didn't need to advocate anymore. We didn't need to fight. The Board of Ed knew that a school was, uh, needed to be built. So what ended up happening is in Jan on January 28th, and I still remember this because we celebrated it in the neighborhood. On January 28th, 1998, the Sun-Times ran a story that three new high schools would be built in the city of Chicago. Walter Payton, Northside Prep, and Little Village High School. January 28th, 
1998 is when that article came out. We started planning. We started engaging the neighborhood and the teachers and the curriculum developers and everybody else who, who wanted to make sure that the school had a full-size gym, we wanted to make sure it had a full-size theater. We don't want a caffeinasium. <laughs> we don't want a gymateria. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it had accessible, built-in daycare for both the teachers and the students because that's a reality in urban Chicago. We wanted to make sure that it had a fully accessible, handicapped accessible pool, because we don't want just one of those splash uh, water park type of things. And we wanted to make sure that the neighborhood, that the community was engaged in its planning, specifically to make sure that it was designed in such a way where the building can be closed and the library can stay open. I mean, common sense, after school stuff. And so we started all the planning. And then, 98, passed up, 99, happened, 2000, crept up on us, and we're watching Walter Payton open up. We're watching Northside Prep open their doors, and we applaud that. Those are all great accomplishments for those neighborhoods, but we're still in the planning process. We're still looking at EPA studies about the soil, you know, this manufacturing site was edible oils. It was cooking oils that was produced there. It wasn't a toxic site, so there wasn't major issues. There was some minor issues. with some concrete we had to remove, but that was minor. And we started to get a little ticked off. And when I say we, I'm talking about the whole neighborhood. I'm talking about everybody who had fought for these schools, all the teachers, all the parents, all the educators, all the activists that had joined us in all the protests and all the marches demanding that these five grammar schools and one high school be built in Little Village, began to get upset. And so the conversation then turned to, all right, so how do we force the Board of Ed to build our school? They bought the land. They promised it in public disclosures. They, they talked about it. How do we hold their feet accountable? How do we hold them to their word? And so in early 2001, a group of parents in the neighborhood started getting together uh, to talk about a, a little bit about what should happen. And one of the participants, uh, her name is Manuelita Garcia, uh, who's, God bless her soul, she's great. Uh, she still visits me, visits me at the ward office every week to tell me about, Rick, you gotta do this, Rick, you gotta do that. And you know, when, when, when Manuelita asks for something, she gets it. Uh, she said something in a meeting that kind of caught us all off guard, but then brought us to reality. She said, why don't we do an act of civil disobedience? Vamos a desobedecerlos, she would say in Spanish. Why don't we just do something drastic? I said, okay, we can protest and close off the street. We can go to City Hall and do a sit down. Because no, let's do a hunger strike. Let's engage the neighborhood in a hunger strike. And so the planning started to doing a hunger strike and we started dealing with the logistics of what it would take, who would undertake the hunger strike, and, and, and here we go. Uh, I'm an eater. <laughs> I'm a foodie, as one would say. Uh, but I actually said, okay, if we, we all wanna go on a hunger strike, let's all, let's do this. Uh, and we started planning that on Mother's Day 2001, this hunger strike would start. It would be symbolic that a group of mothers, hint, hint, Rick, you're not in it. Uh, a group of mothers would engage in an act of civil disobedience protesting the Board of Education's lack of movement on the construction of this new high school that is still very much needed because the overcrowding at Farragut was still there. I mean, our children were still traveling three and a half, four hours back and forth to all these other schools all over the city because they couldn't go to their neighborhood school. And so we started having these conversations and oddly enough, um, one little side note, uh, I actually thought I was going to be part of the hunger strike group, but Manuelita again reminded me of the fact that I was the alderman. Tú no puedes ser uno de los huelguistas, she said. You can't be one of the hunger strikers. You can't be one of the strikers. And I'm like, but why? I've been part of the planning process. I want to help. I want to be there. I want to be supportive. You can do all that. And you can pay for the tents and pay for the porta potties and pay for the stages and pay for the, pay for the sound system. You can do all that, but you can't be part of the hunger strike. I go, but why? Ricardo, if it's you in the hunger strike, then it becomes a fight between the mayor and the alderman. The symbolism isn't right. 
We want it to be a, a fight between the mothers and City Hall, the mothers and the mayor. And she was so right, and I was so relieved. <laughs> Uh, I was so relieved because then that meant that I can continue being a foodie. Uh, but the hunger strike started pretty quiet. As you might guess, only the Spanish language media picked up on the first couple of days. Uh, it wasn't really a big media event. It's just another group of parents demanding something from the Board of Ed, and nowadays that happens all the time. Uh, and I got that phone call. I got that phone call from a gentleman uh, whose, initial, whose name I will not repeat, but whose initials are, are PV. <laughs> yeah, you got it, Paul Vallis. <laughs> and boy, was that a phone call. It was a one-way conversation that I had like this. And he basically told me to go somewhere else, told me that how dare you manipulate these parents into telling them, into leading them to believe that if they go on this act of civil disobedience, we will cave, because we will not cave. Because if we cave to you, we have to cave to every other bleep bleep hunger strike in the city. And it was a one-way conversation. And that was on day three of the hunger strike. And I just said, thank you for your phone call, hung up. Two days later, Paul Vallis quits. I don't know if it had anything to do with me. But the hunger strike was going strong. But it was still a very local piece of news. It was only Univision and Telemundo were carrying it. It did, wasn't really gelling. It didn't really go well. Uh, uh, the neighborhood was starting to come around every evening for the rallies. Uh, but then it happened. We figured it out like on day six or seven. We need to get some national press. Once we get national press, this will explode. And it did. On day eight, we had a writer from the Washington Post visit the camp. The camp was uh, named uh, Camp Cesar Chavez. And we had our uh, 13 hunger strikers there. And the reporter interviewed the hunger strikers. And on day nine of the hunger strike, it got national news. It was in the Washington Post, at which point I've heard, I wasn't there, but I heard that the mayor blew a gasket says, get rid of this annoyance. At that point, we were still struggling to communicate with the Board of Education because Paul Vallis had just uh, quit and Gary Chico had just quit uh, all during the same two weeks of the, of the hunger strike and we were trying to figure out who to talk to. And the conversation then became, uh, came around, okay, what are we doing to fix this problem? How are we getting rid of the hunger strike? And I said, it's very easy. Publicly commit, to a hunger, uh, publicly commit to the construction of the school again. And in this year's budget, allocate the three and a half to four million dollars that is gonna be necessary to buy the steel. We know every building needs steel. So we figured that was a good ask, uh, that it be in the budget so that we can be, have some idea that this was going to be the case, the construction of the school. And so then after about six days of negotiation, we get to day 19, the Board of Ed agrees, and lo and behold, we get the commitment to build a new high school and build a great new facility at 31st and Costner. <laughs> but that's only half the battle. Because in the mind of the Board of Ed and in the mind of the mayor, uh, he wants to build a small school. As you all know, back in 2000, 2001, 2002, the mayor was enamored with small schools. He wanted to build a school for 400 students. That's a deal breaker for our neighborhood, for our activists, for the hunger strikers. We needed to build a school for at least 15 to 1,600 students because the neighborhood demographics de demanded it. Remember that figure I gave you? We had 42 to 4,300 school-aged children in an attendance boundary of a school that can only house 22. It can only house uh, uh, 2,000, so that means that 2,200 were going to other schools. So then, then the struggle began again, and this is where the teachers became an integral part of the coalition uh, in advocating for what ended up being a campus because what we ended up negotiating with the Board of Ed is basically four small schools. 
a campus for four schools where you have a school of math and science, a school of arts and culture, a school of world language, and lo and behold, a school of social justice. Um, and it was the teachers that joined us on the, this committee that was created by the Board of, Ed, Board of Ed called the TAC. And I know somebody earlier said something about acronyms. TAC is the Transitional Advisory Committee for a new school being created. So this TAC was made up of teachers from the neighborhood who interviewed potential principals and participants, uh, curriculum developers, to figure out what those four curriculums were going to be. Because we knew that we were building a campus for four schools. We just didn't know what was going to be in them until this TAC, this Transitional Advisory Committee, ended up selecting those four uh, curriculums that are being taught. So in, in this building, for 1,600 students, is literally designed so that each school is independent of each other physically. And they share in uh, the gym, cafeteria, and yes, we do not have a gym materia. We have a full-size gym and we have a full-size cafeteria. Uh, they share the library, they share the, uh, the, the, the daycare center, they share, they share the auditorium. They have a full stage auditorium with the pit uh, because those are all items that we fought for to make sure that we're in the building. And now uh, what, was, what was thought to be as we were developing the, the, the site, what was thought to be a, a project that would cost between 35 and 38 million dollars ended up costing almost 63 million dollars because of all the additions that we put onto it. But today, if you drive by 31st and Costner, you find a beautiful 300,000 square foot facility. And for those of you that have been in the building, you've seen the cone. There's a cone in the middle with an angle. And that angle is at 19 degrees. 19 degrees uh, of, uh, and if you, uh, of, in honor of the 19-day hunger strike. But that hunger strike was a perfect storm of teachers, parents, activists, your elected officials, and the community coming together. Because for those 19 days, I had never seen, although it was a little lonely the first three or four days, but for those 19 days, I had never seen the community come together around one issue it, with such passion, with such vigor, with such enthusiasm, where you had churches showing up in the afternoons with their congregations. Not just the church pastor, not just the church leader, but him and 300 feligreses, him and 300 congregants, uh, coming and just saying, we're here to help. We had what started as the first three or four days rallies of 100, 200 people a night. By day 11, 12, 13, and 14, our rallies were getting so large that the police actually had to come and close off some streets. We had three, four, 500 every day. And that my friends, is the perfect storm of educators, parents, and activists coming together to make sure that those schools got built. Because as a result of all that hard work, we've got those five grammar schools and one new high school, all within two miles of each other, to relieve the overcrowding and build what I call the neighborhood's human infrastructure uh, that's necessary to provide a valuable education. Thank you very much.